Please carry it away. This is Alan Rockefeller. We all know him, and he's got a nice thing to talk about. Awesome. Thank you. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the mushroom events that are coming up this year, and then show you some of the things that I've been up to this year. I'm just going to go in the order that they're happening. And the next mushroom event that I know of is August 4th to 6th in Pennsylvania, and that's MycoFest. But if I'm missing any, please let me know. Uh, MycoFest is uh, run by William Padilla Brown. And so he's a permaculture guy and mycologist that lives in Pennsylvania. That's him in the middle there. And there's all sorts of cool mushroom people there doing mushroom stuff. Here I am cloning some mushrooms out in the field. Turns out you don't actually need a flow hood to use auger. And there's some partying. <laughs> this guy was really good. And lots of talks. And this is Jawa Ruho, who gave a really good talk on uh, cordyceps and entom, entom uh, can't even pronounce it. It was fun to eat bugs. And so here's one that he found. And what he does when he goes mushroom hunting is he doesn't look on the ground. He looks underneath all of the leaves. Mm -hmm. So he just goes from plant to plant. And, you know, if there's like a branch, he'll just like look at the branch over his head or just flip up all the leaves and find stuff like this. So this is about one centimeter across, but it's a bovaria. And growing on a spider. Another cool thing that we see at MycoFest is Chromelosporiopsis corulescens. So it looks like this really cool purple fuzz at the base of the trees. It's really tiny, like this is full size moss here. And then the next one after that uh, is the Telluride Mushroom Festival. So that is in Telluride, Colorado. And uh, you can see it's really pretty there, August 16th to the 20th. Um, this one, I'm going to be teaching a photography workshop with Allison Polak. And there's lots of uh, mushroom people who love mushrooms there. <laughs> and there's lots of science. And this is Mike Wood's microscope class. And here we have Laura Guzman giving a talk on psilocybe. And then the next one is the NAMA foray. And the NAMA foray is going to be in North Carolina this year. It's August 24th to the 27th. It's going to be a really good NAMA foray, so you definitely shouldn't miss it. Um, but the registration opens on April 1st. And the last time they had a foray in North Carolina, it sold out in four days. This one might even sell out sooner. So if you want to go, you need to register really soon after you, April 1st. You need to be a NAMA member first. Then you can register. Hmm. What is that, $25? I think it's $25, yeah. Definitely a, a good organization to join. Um, oh, they also have, um, they also are doing a foray in Mexico the first week of August. It's like a week or 10 day long thing, kind of near Mexico City. And the NAMA foray has kind of an older crowd. This is what the NAMA foray looks like. And they have speakers like this. This guy, this guy was super awesome. That's Henry Becker, who's the world expert on Hebaloma. And he was able to talk for a whole hour on Hebaloma and make it interesting, which was super cool. <laughs> and they had forays and stuff. And then September 18th to the 22nd, I'm gonna teach a week long mushroom photography class with Allison Polak. Uh, met in Madeline Island, Wisconsin. So we'll just be hunting mushrooms and taking pictures all day and then uh, processing the photos and learning how to take really cool mushroom pictures. And then after that, there's the Georgia Mushroom Festival, September 30th, October 1st. Um, that'll be a pretty good one as well. And then there's the Memphis Mushroom Festival, November 3rd to the 5th. And that's all that I know of now, but there's actually probably going to be a mushroom festival every single weekend uh, once the season really gets going. So I started this Facebook group. It's called Mushroom Events of the USA. 
So if you want to stay uh, up to date on all the mushroom events, just join that group and they all got posted in there. And then uh, for Mexico, we have uh, another group that I started, Eventos de Ango Silvestres in Mexico. So it's wild mushroom events in Mexico. And there's going to be quite a few uh, events in Mexico as well, mostly fungus fairs and stuff like that. And then the online event is this Continental Michael Blitz. And this is a really unique event uh, because Stephen Russell from, with the Hoosier Mushroom Society is organizing it. And we just finished our West Coast Michael Blitz. Um, the, what happens is people go out and they take pictures of mushrooms and make iNaturalist observations and then send in the dried samples. And then Stephen Russell does DNA sequencing on all of those dried samples. And so Keith um, estimates that he's going to need to do DNA sequencing on 40,000 collections from Indiana to figure out how many uh, mushrooms there really are in Indiana. And he's going to need 100,000 from just the rest of the United States to be able to even calculate how many mushrooms we have in the United States. But right now, nobody has any idea how many mushrooms. Where the Michael Blitz comes in because they're blitz for free. Um, the first first uh, ten collections are free, and then the, after that it's like three dollars each, which is about one tenth of the normal price. So um, the next one is August eleventh to the twentieth, and this is anywhere in Canada, United States, or Mexico. You can participate um, in that one, and also October thirteenth through the twenty second. Mm -hmm. Is it worth posting it, or are we really more interested in kind of the obscure different ones that you thought? The obscure ones are usually more interesting, but it's also really interesting to know like how many species we have that we think is a common mushroom that is actually maybe a whole group of species. So one of the colonies as well as the yeah, like you know, I usually grab like one example of each species each day. So if I see like, you know, 20 Baldivius tinto pads, I'll just grab one, but still grab one of even the common things. Oh, just a reminder from the Zoom group, uh, please speak loudly if you're asking questions so that everyone can hear. <laughs> Try to remember to repeat them as well. The last night I stayed up pretty late putting mushrooms in tubes. So um, about, I have about 50 boxes sitting by my front door and that's all the Michael Blitz stuff. And so this is 130 tubes, 130 mushrooms. I think I got about 10% of the way through them. Um, so we have, we'll have a lot of cool data um, when this all gets run. And this is being run with a sequencing technology called Nanopore. And so Nanopore is much different than Sanger. Sanger was what we've been doing for a long time. Uh, but nanopore costs the same amount to do the DNA sequencing if you do one or a 960. So um, it costs a lot to set up, but once you have it all going, it makes it much less expensive to do uh, DNA barcoding of large amounts of samples. So I've also been going around to all of the California mushroom events and uh, just grabbing a little bit of each collection that comes in. So we have about 600 um, collections that came in to Summer Camp and the MSSF Fair and uh, a couple other events too. And so what I do is I just take, a, take the mushrooms, throw them on black felt. So this is just a piece of black felt and I do these earth tongues on the black felt, take a picture real fast and move on to the next one. And that way I can get good, good quality photographs of all of these mushrooms very quickly and send them all in for DNA barcoding. Mm -hmm. So the really cool thing I found recently is this one. This is Lepiota ludiophila. And Lepiota ludiophila is one of the least common mushrooms in the world. I think it only grows in a space that's about 20 feet long and 10 feet wide. And so that's, um, that's over in the Crystal Springs watershed uh, in the big cypress groves over there. And so really striking mushroom with bright yellow gills. And only known from a couple collections. And here's what the Kylosis video looks like. So that's the uh, gill edges and the spores. But I found that it was extremely fluorescent. Maybe I can get rid of some of these. Uh, that's a little better. 
Can I make this bar go away? Maybe not. Much better. Okay, so this thing was extremely fluorescent. It was the brightest fluorescent mushroom that I've ever seen. And so with ultraviolet light, it looks like this. And so um, I use an ultraviolet light like this one. Uh, it's a 365 nanometer light, so it's almost invisible. Um, but it's actually extremely bright. This is like 15 watts of light. So if you shine this on something fluorescent, it lights up really brightly. So these things were just ridiculously bright in the uh, ultraviolet light. And then another cool thing that's super common, but I didn't see it until last week, is this Centrichium papillatum. And so this is a plant parasite. It... Um, it's on some what's this, uh, thing. This is like a rhodium, so a super common weed, but it makes these red, like little papillate things all over the leaves. So a lot more common in Southern California than here. But in the microscope, it looks pretty cool. And then this is our most common Cortinarius under course libo, Cortinarius oloni. So I've been collecting just about everything I can find for this um, nanopore sequencing. Definitely lots of these craterellus up. This is the really common yellow foot. It still doesn't have a name yet, but I think a good name for it would be craterellus pacificus, because it only grows along the West Coast. It's definitely not the craterellus tubeformis from Europe. And then another super common mushroom that doesn't have a name yet is this hygrosity. And we call it hygrosity flovescens, but the real hygrosity flovescens um, is found, yeah, uh, it's described from Michigan. It's all over the East Coast. This one's quite a bit different. And then here's a super rare one. Um, this one is Gleophorus subaromaticus. And this is so rare that I think I might be the only, I think I'm the only person that's ever put it on iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer. Um, but I found just a few of them in Mendocino County uh, about a month ago. And it's called subaromaticus because it has this weird smell. It's almost like some kind of plasticky smell, which is not what you'd expect for a little grossity type thing. And that's what it looks like in ultraviolet light. What's the scale of that? Uh, These are kind of small. I think the big one was almost an inch across. Are there things around here that look like that? Kind of. I think like the most common thing would be the uh, hygrophorus, um, that like hygrophorus, Rosa Brunius type thing. Um, looks kind of like that, but this is smaller. And so I think that's like the main difference between that and the hygrophorus. Do they, do they, in the black light, do they show the same? I don't know if I've tried the hygrophorus in the black light. I really should. And I've been kind of enjoying these earth tongues recently. Um, there's a few really common ones and a few really rare ones. And here's a calicera from Salt Point. So these things are super slimy and they grow on wood, usually common for wood. And then this one is a trichoglossum earth tongue, but it has a parasite called the Hypomyces papillospore var americanus. So that's this white part of the top. And this is super rare. I think it's only been recorded twice in California. And the first time Debbie Klein found it, she gave it to me and I sequenced the DNA and put it in GenBank. And it's the only DNA sequence of it in GenBank. And then this one Mandy found in Salt, at Salt Point State Park. So it's not very common at all. Salt Point. Salt Point State Park is about three hours, maybe a little more than three hours drive from here, but it's just north of, it's like Northern Sonoma County. So um, it's definitely worth the drive because there's a lot of trees that occur there that we don't have here. Um, main one is like Grand Fir, maybe it's Grandis. So there's a lot of mushrooms that grow with Grand Fir that don't grow with other trees. So as soon as you get to Salt Point, you start seeing a lot of species that you see in the Pacific Northwest that you don't see in the Bay Area. It's also one of the few state parks where you're allowed to pick mushrooms. 
Um, maybe the only state park where you're allowed to pick mushrooms. So definitely worth the trip though. You're far enough away here that you should probably stay the night and go for a couple of days. So why not? I would look at that as another stuff. Yeah, the, the candle snuff thing is really woody and it grows directly from wood. So these things grow from the ground and they're a lot softer than that. They're like they're fleshy. Softer and less woody. Exactly, yeah. I guess we're just stuck with this box at the top and let's see how to fix that. That's okay. Well, you can see it after a while if I stop complaining about it. Um, this is some that I found in Texas. And um, Eastern Texas has a really good mushroom season. Um, in fact, they're going to have a foray there sometime in the summer that's going to be really good. I don't know if they've picked a date yet. Um, but um, Eastern Texas is basically like Louisiana. It's got a lot of oaks and really good mushroom diversity. And then here's a Clavulinopsis. I think all the Clavulinopsis in California are new species. When you say new, is that usually this is coming from somewhere else? Like no, the plants I see are a really long time. Um, we just haven't haven't put a name on them yet. I think we're just borrowing European names from, for those for now. And um, when I was in Eastern Texas, I got to hang out with Bart Buick, who is uh, one of the world experts on Rusula. And so it takes an amazing amount of patience to uh, figure out all these Rusula. And he got me interested in Rusula too. So now I'm trying to get nice collections and photos of these Rusulas. Here's one of the really common ones from Salt Point, which we would call Rusula Amedica, but I would be shocked. Um, or Rusula Silvicola or something. I'd be shocked if it actually was that. Rusula Cremora color, probably not that one either. But we got a lot of rusulas. This one's kind of cool. We see it under coast live oak and it's brown on the cap with that striate cap margin. And it gets these cool red stains on the stem. And this one I actually was able to figure out, which is really rare. This one's rusula americana. And you'll see this under firs in Mendocino County and Humboldt County. And it's kind of... Um, This one has the red blush on the stem, but the really common one with the red blush on the stem is rhodocephala, which I don't have good photos of yet. And it's a pretty good year for black trumpets. This was a really big one from Salt Point. And then these leotias are super cool. Um, the common name is like jelly baby, and they uh, really like to grow near black trumpets. Um, so they're like the tan oaks. And if you cut them open, they're like super slimy on the inside. And uh, I've sequenced the DNA on these a couple times, and all of the California ones are way different than the ones from the rest of the world. So we probably have an undescribed species here. It looks like they've been a slug of the mushroom. It really does, yeah. And then we got a bunch of different hedgehogs. Um, this hedgehog was really big. It was like six inches across from Salt Point. And we got we have two really big hedgehogs in California. I don't know how to tell them apart, but we have Hidnum, um, Hidnum Washingtoniana, the Hidnum Olympicum. Definitely good eating. And then here's a little hedgehog, probably Hidnum organensi. Uh, but we also have Hid Hidnum... Meliocalidum with pine. This one's with tan oak. So that's at least four that we have here. And it was a pretty good year for candy caps too. So these are some candy caps I found uh, where I live in the East Bay. And here is a crazy uh, cluster of candy caps. That was from this January, also in the East Bay. And I took a nice picture of the candy cap spores. How much magnum, okay? Oh, this is about 1,200 times magnification, um, at least before the projector. When, once it's on the projector, I think it's more like 10,000 times. I mean, you could just uh, hold a ruler up to them and measure the size in there and then calculate how many, but um, yeah, it's quite a few. <clears throat> but they just have these cool reticulation on the on spores there. Here is Mycena hematopus, the bleeding Mycena. I really like the stem texture in this, but 
The thing to really notice about these is the, the cap margin. You see how it has this ragged cap margin? I think this is the only Mycena on the West Coast that has that cap margin. Out East, there's a bunch of them, but out West, that makes this really easy to identify. And then if you cut them, they bleed. So I just like cut it with, with a razor blade. And another cool thing are these, um, these uh, what do they call them tax tons or something, pseudo hidden them. Um, there's two of them on the West Coast. Neither of them are pseudo hidden them gelatinosum. And Elsa Valinga was working on it for a while, but she couldn't figure out how to tell them apart. Um, so they, they look exactly the same. You kind of have to sequence them, but they look really cool when you kind of zoom in. I like the way the edge looks here. And then if you zoom into the middle, it kind of looks like this. So a lot of people will like make candy out of those things. And these slime molds are really cool as well. This is a Leocarpus from Nevada City. And so this is a white light and an ultraviolet. It looks almost the same, but it is super brightly fluorescent. How large would that be? This is a little smaller than a grain of rice. So yeah, definitely all macro photos. And then this is kind of cool. This is Porodidalia. And Porodidalia really likes killing trees. So it's a pine parasite. And it's also very fluorescent. So an ultraviolet light, it looks like that. And then here is Psilocybe alenii from the UC Berkeley campus. That's one of our most common psychedelic mushrooms. Um, this one down here, when you zoom in on it, you can see it looks all crazy. And had a pretty good year for chanterelles. This is Cantharellus californicus, uh, growing with our coast live oak. And then up north, you have Cantharellus formosus. Um, this one has a very strong apricot odor, whereas californicus, not so strong, it's way thinner. Um, so this was really common under Douglas fir and hemlock and stuff like that. So with chanterelles, I like to dry saute them until the water cooks out and then add a little bit of butter. And then when they're just about done cooking, I add fish sauce until they are salty enough and then sugar to kind of balance the salt and the fish sauce. And they taste really good that way. And here is a samosabi. Uh, Samosabis are very poorly known in California. I have DNA sequences of three different ones and I don't know what any of them are. Uh, but the name that we use for this is Samosomy Synthiculus, and none of them are that so far. Uh, here's some Cortinarius. The Cortinarius has this cool cortina hanging off with the rusty orange spores. And so this was from Southern California. I like this one because of the blue colors. Yeah, good, good spore color. And then this one... Uh, I thought it was heavy my scene then when I found it, but it's actually Floyomana minutula. Um, so really cool little delicate thing. It turns out that what we're calling heavy my is actually several different genera that are only very distantly related. Here's a mock oyster, Phyllotopsis nibulans. And this one, um, I just learned this year, but I kind of saw it all over the place. Enti uh, Entiloma tracheospora. Uh, looks pretty cool in ultraviolet light as well. Uh, this one was all over in Mendocino County. You can see it has this cool kind of aqua uh, fluorescent mycelium. And then this one is really cool, uh, Entiloma subcarneum. And this one is super fluorescent as well. So you never find very many of these when you find them, but, um, but yeah, I love the stem texture and ultraviolet. They have these like bright aqua droplets on them. And then here's a Swillus umbanatus. So this is super common in Mendocino County, the Swillus umbanatus, this little one. And then the big ones are these Kruganthus. It's parasitizing the Swillus. And the Kruganthus looks really cool when you zoom way in. And here's Romeria aerospora, a uh, cool, delicious, edible red Romeria. It grows with tan oak. And here's a little Entiloma 
uh, from subgenus Cyanula. It's kind of cool because when you zoom way in, you can see the gill edges are blue. So that means we call this Entoloma cerulatum, though I'd be shocked if it actually turned out to be that. And here's a pretty rare one, Neoalbatrellus subceruleoporus. Um, it's common in certain patches. Um, I, got, I saw this in Mendocino County, um, but usually people just never see it. But when I did find it, there was hundreds of them. And it looks cool in ultraviolet light. So that's with white light, and that's with ultraviolet. And then this one is like Tetrapyrgos subdendrophora. And usually it grows on grass, but this was just growing on some kind of shrub. Uh, but this one, I usually see it up north, but this is from Los Angeles. Always makes a good macro photo. And then these are really nice, Marasmias placatulis. Um, Pretty common around here as well, but I really like this one because if you see like this edge of the cap here, if you zoom in on that, it ends up looking really cool. So that one, I just um, just kind of like cropped it to that. And I also like the droplets on the stem there as well. And then here's Um I never shoot photos of mushrooms in direct sunlight, but I decided to break that rule this time and I just put this directly in a sunbeam and kind of put the camera behind it. I actually like how it turned out. And here's a little Mycena, also from Los Angeles. And then here's the purple chanterelle or uh, pig's ear, Gonfus clavatus. Although the real clavatus is in Europe and this one doesn't have a name yet. Um, you can see lots of yellow spores accumulating here. See that, that one. Uh, Schizophrenum communi is kind of cool because when you shine ultraviolet light on it, you get a really good root color. So this mushroom has over 20,000 different sexes and can eat people. Yeah. <laughs> And then here's a terrible photo of Lacaria amethystio oxidantalis um, that I took in Point Reyes. And the reason it's such a bad photo is because there was like, a, I was in the shade and then there was a really bright field behind me. So there was all this light coming in from behind the mushroom. Uh, but I set up my camera and set up some additional lights and took this picture and didn't like how it turned out. So I took a piece of black velvet and I hung it in the tree. Uh, behind this, and then took the same photo with the same settings and same lighting. Just like that. You can see it turned like a really terrible photo into one of my best photos. And the only thing that changed was just hanging a piece of black velvet in the tree branches. Yeah, the colors are just all washed out on that. I think just because the light was coming in from so many different directions. <laughs> But um, yeah, I always carry black velvet now. Even if you're just using a cell phone, the black velvet really helps, uh, especially if you have it kind of far away, so it's really out of focus. And then here is Mycena adsendens. It has this little disc at the base of the stem. And this one looks pretty cool in ultraviolet as well. And here's one that I uh, was seeing a lot. This one was in Colorado, but like all over California, Michigan and West Virginia, this is Calibia, uh, Calibia cochiae. So Calibia fruits from sclerotia. So these are sclerotia here, it's these little pea-sized things. And then the mushrooms fruit directly out of that. It also oh, looks cool in ultraviolet. What's that? Is that like intermediate between the mycelium and the fruiting body? So sclerotia, is kind of these nodules of compressed mycelium um, that the mushroom uses maybe to store energy. So if it's like dry or it's, it needs to like hang on for a few years, um, it can probably do that with the sclerotia. But you just have these nodules that are kind of like kind of like peas and, and they root out of that. But it's a plant-based thing? It's Latin name is Oh, okay. It's by the same Latin group. 
And then this here are these here are methylene blue crystals. So methylene blue is a microscopy stain. And so I use it to change the color of my mushrooms. But if you take it and you just leave a little bit of methylene blue in a microscope slide and let it dry, and then view it with polarized light at 100 times magnification, you get these really interesting looking patterns. And I wanted to take a minute to show you how I do my photography these days. Um, so if you notice um, with all of my photos, there's um, I have lots of depth of field, but there's also uh, the, back the backgrounds are very blurry, and that's because I'm using a technique called focus stacking. So with focus stacking, I take a whole lot of pictures and combine them uh, all into one photo. And I, I started doing this about three years ago, and I like the results so much that now I do it on every single picture I take. And if I'm not going to do focus stacking, then I just use my cell phone. Uh, but if I actually care how the photo is going to turn out, that I will um, use this feature called focus shift shooting, which takes a whole lot of pictures. And then I have the software that combines them all into one picture. And I can combine as many as I like, so I can get as much depth of field as I want. And the photos come out so much more sharp and clear. And so I use that for everything. But the smaller the mushroom is, the more important it is to focus stack it. But I just wanted to show you really quick how the process works. And so here I have selected um, a whole bunch of pictures, and then I will bring them into Helicon Focus. So here I've selected 60 photos, and we're going to co combine these 60 pictures into one picture. And so what it's doing is figuring out which parts of those 60 pictures have the highest contrast, because if it has the highest contrast, then that means that that's the part that's in focus. And now it's combined all those 60 into one. And you can like zoom way in and just get really incredible detail here. And if I had done this any other way, you know, you wouldn't have this sort of detail or depth of field. Where and then is, where are the settings? Uh, settings, uh, usually I try to set it up so the ISO is really low and the aperture is always all the way open. Um, so it would be like ISO 64 and f2.8 or so, and then usually it takes about like between a quarter and a tenth of a second for each um, for each quarter to a tenth of a second shutter speed for each photo. So you talk about this and the camera does all 60. Yeah, camera does all 60 and then I combine them on the computer. How do you provide lighting? To the, it's not a flashlight. Not a flash. Uh, occasionally I use natural light, but nine times out of 10, I put some extra LED lights. So I have these ULENSI lights. They're about 20 bucks and they charge with USB-C. Um, and you don't need to do that with this, but they always look better with just a little bit more light so you don't get shadows right where the gills are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, when you take your, your series of photos, does the, does the camera shift the depth of field? Yeah. Uh, the camera's changing the focus okay. each time. So it's, it's just um, using the autofocus on the lens. And so it changes the autofocus a little bit, takes down the picture, turns the autofocus a little bit. Okay. But most cameras don't have that feature, but you can do it manually, either by taking a picture and then changing the autofocus to set with your fingers and then take another picture until you're done. Or you can move the camera closer. So you can use a focusing rail, if you like turn this screw that moves the camera a little bit closer. Or if you have a lot of light or you raise your ISO, you can even handhold it and just uh, turn on the high speed shooting mode. So it's shooting like four or six photos per second. And yeah, I just move the camera closer to the mushroom. And uh, that actually, actually gets pretty good results sometimes. So with a tripod, it's a little more precise and you're more likely to get better results. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see, um, how I have as much depth of field as I want, but then the background is really blurry, and that's because the aperture was all the way open. So does the camera or does the program know um, what it is what it is trying to emphasize? In other words, uh, you know, you 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 tell it look at this group here and ignore anything beyond that 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 level so that it is blurry? What I do is I will use the focus and focus it on the closest, the thing that I want, uh, the closest thing to the lens that I want to be in focus. And then it just keeps taking the pictures over and over and over. And I always tell, tell it to take too many pictures. <laughs> and then just later on the computer, I'll decide which of those images to combine into my final image. 
So I'll kind of flip through them and just look at the one where the very furthest part of the mushroom is in sharp focus. And then that'll be my last one. And for the first one, you know, I like it when the foreground is like really sharp. So I usually start with like the foreground You just do the whole foreground and everything. Cause it looks kind of weird in the final frame. It's like the mushroom is really sharp, but then it's blurry before, you know, yeah. But it's, it's better if it's like sharp closer and then just really blurry in the background. It's a lot more natural. So you can um, see that I did I did that well, really on all of them, but you can see how blurry the background is here, but how you have lots of stuff in focus up here. Uh, this is Strobilurus congenioides, which is super common little Strobilurus that's on all the magnolia cones in South Texas. And if you kind of zoom in, you can see that it's got little tiny hairs all over it. I only carry one lens and it's a 50 millimeter macro lens. So here's a garter snake that I found. <laughs> And then there's a little tiny Pluteus. There's a lot of little tiny Pluteuses. That one was about two inches tall. So not microscopic. Here's auricularia. I kind of like this one because the light was shining through the auricularia. Um, this is from Texas as well. And then here's Willis. Maybe we ended up calling it Swillis Discipians. Um, but in, uh, this time I was hanging out with Jay Justice, who's a super cool guy who lives in Arkansas and he knows all these bullies pretty well. Some of you can probably know him. Here is a little, looks like Parasola, but Parasola always has a completely smooth cap surface. You see these little hairs on there. So this is this new genus that just got invented called Kulosis. Uh, it used to be Copernellus. And this thing is super common in the Santa Cruz area, though I found it in Texas. This is Henningsomyces. And nobody really knows how many species of Henningsomyces there are or what to call them. Uh, but if you do a lot of flipping over logs, um, you'll find these pretty often. And here's a Resupinatus. Uh, there's a lot of Resupinata species. They're all very mysterious because they've never really been studied from around here. And here is Mycena melangina. So this thing is really tiny. Like this whole thing was maybe an inch long. And this uh, is what we used to call Mycena corticola. And it always grows on the bark of trees. So this is some oak bark here. And always a really tiny thing in the bark of trees. Here's how it starts out. And then in Texas, you also have these red Tremedes. So this is Tremedes sanguinea. And then this year I went to Mexico twice. And uh, the first time was uh, the West Coast, Jalisco, for about 10 days. And the second time was um, the West Coast, um, East Coast in Veracruz. So this is Psilocybe subtropicalis. And this one's kind of cool because in ultraviolet light, the gill edges uh, light up like that. So I just took the same picture with this regular white light and with the ultraviolet light. Um, both of these are about 120 photos combined into one. And so about 80 of those are just down the stem here because the closer you get, the more you need. And then the other 20 are like the rest of the camp. And then these things here were super cool. They were underneath these leaves, and they are caterpillars. They're chrysalis that looks like they're made of like solid silver or something. And first time I saw them was like a few years ago, but I didn't get a good picture of them. So this time I was like sure to get a good picture of them. 
Um, they were just ridiculously shiny. Mm -hmm. And so this is the picture I got in the field. And then I just grabbed the leaf and brought it back. And a few hours later, they had almost hatched. So all of a sudden, you could see the wings through, um, you know, it wasn't so silver anymore. It like became translucent. And then I had to leave. And so I didn't see the butterflies they turned into. But my friend said that they were flying around the house and stuff. But they actually look a lot like cats. If you look at the ears there, it's sort of cats. Or to dog people, they look more like dogs. <laughs> and then here's Amanita muscaria from Pacifica. Start out like that, and then they turn like that. And then I took it and threw it out of the auger because everybody says you can't grow Amanita muscaria, um, but you actually can grow the mycelium, you just can't fruit it. So this is the Amanita muscaria mycelium magnified a hundred times. It's growing across a petri dish. And um, if you try cloning Amanita muscaria, you'll know you have the right thing because it's extremely slow. It grows about one centimeter per month. So I made this plate about a year ago and I still have it. And it still hasn't gone across the plate all the way. Uh, but most things go way faster on auger. So it makes it really easy. You don't have to sequence the DNA to know what you have growing. But in this case, I did just, um, just to make sure that it really was Amanita muscaria growing. So do we have any more respectful when we're picking Amanita muscaria out in the wild? Because it grows so slow. Uh, it grows really slowly on auger, but it's really common uh, under pine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, mycelium's underground. So I think uh, no matter how many you pick, the same amount will come back in other years. Um, but if you uh, if you don't want them to come back, if you trample the soil really good, then that will stop them. So like if it's a death cap patch, you could try trampling them, but it probably just end up spreading the spores. Uh, really, the amount of mushrooms has to do with the uh, amount of rain and the amount of habitat destruction. And very few things that we can do as mushroom pickers will really affect the, the mushrooms at all. This thing is really cool. This is Tyrannus uh, carulia. And we do not have this out west. So I found this one in Missouri at the Nama Foray. And somebody sent me the coordinates. I went out there at midnight to look for it, but I couldn't find it. So then uh, somebody else showed me where it was the next day. But really cool thing. It was this massive log. It was just covered in this royal blue crust fungus. And so it magnified 100 times. This is the actual color, not even a stain. And then this is the wood here. And then 400 times, you can start to see all the hyphae in there. And then there's a thousand times, looks like the, the woods, the kind of round, boxy cells of the wood there, and then the mycelium. And then uh, we see lots of scorpions uh, when I'm walking around at night with the ultraviolet light. All of the scorpions glow super bright. Um, this one was in Alabama, at the Alabama Mushroom Festival. And here is Allotropa, Alloclavaria. And this one I like because it's, um, it's really just red from the algae, but it's a uh, honey mushroom mycelium. So it's those blue lace kind of like rhizomorphs, mm -hmm. the Bibularia malaya. And I photographed those in Amsterdam. There's some more. And then if you take honey mushrooms and you throw them on auger, they grow the rhizomorphs on auger and they end up looking like this. Um, so this is Armillaria sinipina, which is super common in Santa Cruz, but this particular one came from Salt Point State Park. And um, when you turn the lights off, they look like this. So these are not fluorescent, but actually bioluminescent. So they're making their own light. Uh, but the mushrooms themselves don't glow at all. It's only the uh, the mycelium that glows. So you can kind of see like where the roots emerge out of the auger uh, are the places that it glows the most brightly. That was just one picture, but it was a really long exposure. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I took a picture with ISO 200,000 for 30 seconds, 
And that lets me know, kind of like gives me an idea of how bright it is and lets me get everything in focus and everything. And then I did something more like four minutes on ISO 800. So then, you know, ISO 200,000 is super sensitive, but it's really grainy. It's not a very good photo, photo but down at ISO 800, it was pretty reasonable, reasonable photo, but still sensitive enough to get that. So, um, yeah, all those, that particular bioluminescence on this just was one picture. This one I found in Arizona, and out of all the places that I went this year, the mushroom season was the best in Arizona. Um, you can hardly take a step in the woods without stepping on mushrooms, so there's just hundreds of things everywhere you look. Uh, but this one kind of caught my attention, because last year there was a newspaper article that came out, and it said, like, um, they wrote a whole newspaper article about this rare blue mushroom that was found in Arizona. And so I kind of saw these, and I'm like, oh, I wonder if this is the one they wrote the newspaper article about. And so I collected it and brought it to the Telluride Mushroom Festival, and in my DNA barcoding class, we sequenced this, and it turned out that it matched the sequence of the one that made the news 100%. So this is the one. It's uh, Entoloma occidentale var metallicum. Let's see, here's a paniola cyanescens, an ultraviolet light, same thing, white light. And here's a calopsera. And a coltricea. Um, these things are super tiny. They were in the cloud forest in Jalapa, Mexico. There's a lot of very weird things in the cloud forest. It's one of the most diverse habitats on earth. Uh, Definitely a good place to go mushroom hunting. So is that pores or teeth? These are pores. Yeah. So like even in California, we have a bunch of coltraceas as well. And they're pretty poorly known in California. So the ones from Mexico are even less known. I've sequenced a few of them and none of them really had any matches in Gen Bank at all. How would you describe that margin? <laughs> That's a good question. How would I describe that margin? Uh, yeah, I don't even have words for it, but spiky. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. These are about one centimeter across. That's a little tiny thing. And then here is a gallerina from also from Jalapa. Uh, I found this about two inches away from the last one, the Coltricia. But this gallerina is cool because it's got this really spiny, acutely papillate cap. And then this one is, this one is Mycena guzmanii. So this is a, a little bioluminescent Mycena that's really common um, in the cloud forest, but was undescribed until a couple of years ago. And it makes the leaves glow in the dark, but it's got this cool layer of slime all over it. And here's the Mexican version of a shiitake. So this is Lantinula boiriana. It grows on oak logs and it's really common early in the season and it tastes, it smells just like a shiitake from Asia. But it's native there. And here's Metarhizium. Metarhizium likes to grow on these beetles. And then here is uh, my semen phyllopes. I like how this one looks in ultraviolet light. And then Ganoderma looks really cool in ultraviolet light. This one is Ganoderma suge and Ganoderma lobatum. So they look kind of similar um, in white light, but in ultraviolet light, you can see they look super different. And then here's one of those these nice crystal wing butterflies. So it just hatched and it's got these transparent wings. And undescribed cordyceps. So that's fruiting from this bug. And some hemimycena. And more hemimycena. None of these are actually hemimycena, but that's what we're going to call them for now. And then here is Hohenbihelia mastrucata. Um, this one was from Michigan, and uh, it was about two centimeters across. Is it, on a plant? it was growing on an old oak tree. And then here's an undescribed species of psilocybe that uh, occurs in California up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. So like this, this one is really common off of Highway 4. 
Uh, but the cool thing about it is that the cap never opens up, it just stays closed. And genetically, it's right next to Psilocybe hopii, so it's in the cyanescence group. And fruits in the spring, about a month after the snow melts, at real high elevation. Here's some Chylocystidia of Inosibi. Oh, and this is a slime mold that I've been wanting to find for a while, Ceratia mixa morcaliformis. So it looks, you know, it's named after morels. Looks a lot like morels, but they're only like a couple of millimeters big. But um, kind of like the clear stems on these. I like how this one looks like diamonds. Oh, I saw that one. Oh, and then this one is a super rare psilocybe from Amsterdam. This one is psilocybe liniformans. And until I found it, I kind of was doubting that it was even a real species because there was no DNA sequence of it in GenBank and no good photos of it. But it turns out that it is a real species. And so now I have this sequence of GenBank. And this is Claytonia, kind of a cool orchid from around here. And then this you probably see all the time on Manzanita. Uh, so this, uh, this fungus, it's like a puccinia, and it turns the manzanita sprouts bright blood red. And then here's one of these nice uh, aeroscalpiums, uh, growing on a pine cone from Mexico. And uh, Murasmius vagus was described from Australia, but then it turned up in Florida, and it's all over Mexico as well. And there's Pineola cyanescens. There's my friends photographing Pineola cyanescens. Mm -hmm. And uh, Plarocypha. And there was a lot of morels this spring. These are from uh, Morcella americana from Oregon. So this is the super common morel that's all over the East Coast, but on the West, it's under uh, cottonwoods and poplars. Mm -hmm. And here's some blue chanterelles. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a lot of blue chanterelles this year. They had a really good year. And occasionally I take pictures of plants too. So if you have like spores from the morel and you have more trees, could you introduce more else to the apple? I think so. I think it'd be better than spores would be like just maybe dried morels or even fresh morels. Because the spores, you never know if they're going to germinate or outcompete what's already there. Whereas if you have the mycelium are, are already going. Um, and probably have a much better chance to compete. But morels grow really well in auger. They'll go across the plate in like a week. And they also grow really well in grain spawn. So you get a culture going, you can uh, definitely make a lot of spawn and probably get something going that way. This one I found at Mount Shasta. And I thought it was a crepidotis. And nobody studies crepidotis, so I felt really sorry for it. So I took a nice picture of it. And I brought it back and spent the $9 to DNA sequence it. It turns out it's not a crepidotis at all. It's actually a pleurocybella, um, but a new one that no one had seen before. So it's just like a really rare thing, or maybe it's really common, just no one ever looked at it. But uh, it's only about a centimeter across. But at least now I know to look out for it. And then from North Carolina, some kind of Ophiocordyceps, I think maybe in the memorabilis group. Mandy found that. Oh, here's what it looks like in North Carolina. So this is where that namophore is gonna be. Definitely a place with a lot of good mushrooms. And this thing is crazy. This is a parasite that grows on sterium. It's all over the East Coast and all over Mexico. This one's from Oaxaca. And my favorite polypore from Mexico, Hexagonia, Hexagonia herta. And then if you're ever hiking in California and um, you're just walking along the trail and it smells like weed, really strong, it's almost always this plant here. So this plant is Neveredia sporosa. And you can see it's very spiny. And um, you touch it and it's really sticky. It has a lot of trichromes on it. And it smells just like skunk variety of cannabis sativa. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Because um. <laughs> uh, I was just walking along the trail. And I'm like, oh my gosh, is there a weed farm here? But there was no weed farm. It was this. <laughs> then here is a uh, coyote mint. 
modern Della. We got a bunch of Coyote mints in the area here. Canis concatus. There's those uh, false oysters. That was from Coil Hollow. And then here's some uh, Enoki from Mexico. And then I did this trip with Joey, who makes the crime case, but thought me dozen videos. Yeah. And he's very funny, and he found this really crazy terrestrial orchid. Mm -hmm. um, so that's him making a video on the orchid. If you go on YouTube, you can see his video. It's like 10 minutes long where he rants and raves about this orchid. <laughs> uh, here's my photo of it. It actually is pretty cool looking. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes I'll travel like, you know, more than a thousand miles with Joey to just look for a rare plant. Because there's some plants that are so rare they only grow in like one pile of rocks in the whole world. So it's kind of fun to like go there and find them and then get some seed and donate it to the rare plant nurseries. So then if some Republican comes along and just torches the pile of pile rocks, <laughs> um, then uh, at least they won't go extinct. Here's some passion, uh, passion flora, passion flora. And these marasmias I like a lot. And the mammaria, it's always super delicious. There's a rusula de simulans. This is uh, what it looks like normally. Here's what it looks like in ultraviolet light. Well, I hope it tastes like mint. Right? There are a lot of rusulas get that color, but this is the same mushroom, rusula de simulans, just a close up of the gills. Pretty cool looking thing. That was from Point Reyes. And then here is Salvia divinorum, which is the hallucinogenic mint from Oaxaca. So it's endemic to Oaxaca. Uh, but these were cultivated in Oakland. And with plants, you can focus stack them like mushrooms, but for focus stacking, it needs to be extremely still. So you just have to bring the plants inside where there's no breeze at all. And then here's some more slime mold. This slime mold's super common in snow melt up in the mountains. Arcelia versicolor. And here's a picture I took through the microscope, but it was a long exposure. And um, it's like a whole bunch of currents flowing under the cover slip. So I ended up looking kind of cool. Here's a Mycena from Mount Rainier. And the gill edge, I have these Kylosistidia that look like pineapples. And here's a Bovista from Colorado. That's the same thing with ultraviolet light and white light. And then here's the tetrapugos on grass stem. Tilichildium from Oregon. That's ultraviolet, that's white light. And here's those uh, tilipocladium things that are growing on the Alaphomyces truffle. And the truffle spore, um, turns out truffle spores look awesome. <laughs> And here's some Dulistoma from Amsterdam. And Usnia has this usnic acid, which is a super fluorescent water soluble acid. So here's the same photo with just like light and no light. And then this lichen looks really cool, like a jellyfish or something. And I, I like this plant, this is Viola glabella. Because the uh, top of the leaf glows blue in ultraviolet light and the bottom of the leaf glows red. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And then some more, something from West Virginia. I never figured out what that was. But here's that cool uh, vine swallowtail caterpillar. Where'd you pick that? West Virginia. It turned out that the whole Midwest was dry for a while. So West Virginia, like that hurricane, just the edge of the hurricane hit West Virginia. It was the only place we could go that had mushrooms. Here's some cordyceps. It's growing on a bug. And this is Loratomyces squamosus. And they look pretty cool in ultraviolet light because the gill edges light up. And some lycoperdon puffballs. Multiclavula are basidio lichens. There's a foliotina with that movable ring. And Plicotrops is crispa. So the underside looks really awesome. The top looks pretty boring. And here's some slime mold. This is a crazy thing. It's Tectella uh, from out east. It's this uh, thing that has a weird veil that covers it. 
And here's our Lacteria syndigo. Psilocybe neohalapensis and the rain. You can see the raindrops coming down. Cloud forest. And this is Protubera, which is like a stinkhorn thing. It never opens up. This is what it looks like when you shine really bright light through it. And then this is, I think, maybe the last one I have. This is a Selegionella. And Selegionella is like an ancient lineage of moss. And then the very tips have the chlorophyll. And so uh, in ultraviolet light, they look like this. And then white light, they look like that. And then Psilocybe zapaticorum. I think that's the last thing I have. Yeah. Oh, I could find out on iNaturalist. Um, so, yeah, I put them all on there and I can make it tell me. Is it rains? Yeah, we, the last year was pretty fun. Uh, all right, well, thank you, Alan, for your uh, awesome engaging presentation.